Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Sandwich Glass Museum for the Talk of the Town speaker series. My name is Bill Daly, and I'm the manager of this program. Time goes by, it's hard to believe. This is actually the fifth year we've been doing this. So I hope you've enjoyed them over the, that period of time. And we have a, uh, we have a wonderful speaker for, uh, for, your, for your entertainment tonight. I first want to say that this series is made possible by a grant from the Sandwich Cultural Council. That's very important. Without that money, we would not be able to do this. In addition, the Sandwich Glass Museum uh, donates their facility here for us to use, so that is wonderful as well. And the last group I think that we should recognize here tonight is Sandwich Community TV, who televises all of these events, uh, as they do many uh, uh, many events around town. So if you, if, if friends of yours missed this, you want to go back and take notes about some of the intricacies here that you may have missed out on, you can watch it on <laughs> Sandwich uh, Community TV to find that information. So with that, let me introduce you to tonight's speaker. Uh, Laurel K. Gable is a scholar in the field of cemetery and gravestone studies. A popular lecturer, author of numerous essays and articles, and co-author of Gravestones Chronicles 1 and 2, two books about early New England gravestones and the men who carved them. A registered nurse in a previous lifetime, Laura has been an active member of the Association for Gravestone Studies since 1979. She has served multiple terms as an AGS trustee, as the organization's research coordinator, and on the editorial board of Markers, the organization's scholarly journal. She is the recipient of many honors and awards for her contributions to the field of gravestone studies, and after an 18-year stint in upstate New York, uh, she actually came back home here to uh, New England with her husband and now makes her permanent home in Yarmouth Port here on Cape Cod. Uh, Laurel has a number of, uh, of uh, AV material that you're going to see. We might caution you that some of them is a little distorted because of one thing or another. So bear that in mind when uh, she puts that up. It's no fault of Laurel's. It's a technical difficulty here. And I should also uh, remind the sports fans that the Red Sox play tonight at 8.39. So we will not have a conflict of any kind. So with that as a backdrop, please give a warm sandwich welcome to Laurel Gable. <clears throat> My mother wouldn't even recognize that introduction. Uh, go Red Sox. Uh, because if I'm in the audience, I like to know what I'm in for. I'll tell you that I'm going to talk for 48 to 50 minutes. I hope that you'll save questions, and there'll be lots of them at the end. Um, and this is a, just an overview, whisking you through from 1630 to present day gravestone studies. So let's see if I can make this work. Um, ah, These old tombstones are a haunting reminder of a past that we never knew. What do they tell us? Come along with me on a walk through an old burying ground. You may find it fascinating, even beautiful, and I think you'll be amazed at what you can discover if you take the time to look. Graveyards are really outdoor museums, full of history, a chronicle of religious beliefs, art, family genealogy, sometimes tragedy or scandal, even humor, and always the poignant reminders of a different era, a time when contagious disease, infection, or childbirth, for example, posed a threat to survival in a way that we must struggle to comprehend. Consider this powerful example. The rubbing depicts 14 children born to Thomas and Rebecca Park. Thirteen of these children died at or shortly after birth, and the 14th did not survive childhood. The infant deaths probably resulted from an RH incompatibility, a medical problem that could be successfully managed today. 
But think about the human story behind these 14 little circle faces, so graphic on their gravestone. Can you even imagine delivering and burying 14 babies without ever understanding why? And in an age when such tragedies were often seen as manifestations of God's disfavor, imagine the added anguish, guilt, and hopelessness that this tragedy must have caused these parents. The next time you are near an old burying ground, stop a minute to look, really look at these silent artifacts. Gravestones have much to tell us about the past, about our earliest settlers and the world they lived in. Read the epitaphs and the antiquated phrases that describe virtuous and amiable consorts and pious relics. A consort is a husband or a wife, and a relic, R-E-L-I-C-T, is a widow. Notice the popular names of the time, names like contrary, free love, preserved, submit, or silence. And my own favorite, a baby, number 13, named F-I-N-I-S. <laughs> Notice the spelling. Noah Webster's dictionary did not begin to standardize spelling until after 1783 so that decoding the messages on gravestones is sometimes an entertaining challenge. This stone reads, Mary Nash died November the 11th, Anno Domini 1725, age four year. As you explore an old graveyard, see what family relationships you can unscramble or reconstruct. Keep in mind that many of the oldest burying grounds have been rearranged or relocated so that the original burying patterns have often been lost. If you don't find the person you're seeking in one family area, don't give up until you've looked elsewhere in the cemetery. Young married women, especially those who died shortly after marriage, are frequently buried near their parents or their grandparents or with their husband's family rather than with their husband. Occasionally, smallpox victims or suicides were buried outside the boundaries of an established burying ground. Also remember that 17th and 18th century gravestones were frequently removed from an older burying yard when family plots were established in the newer garden style or rural cemeteries that became fashionable in the 19th century. Now, what did our 18th century ancestors die of? If you guessed war and childbirth, you're of course correct. There was a staggeringly high infant and mater maternal mortality rate and many war-related deaths. There were also a surprising number of accidental deaths and drownings. Very few people knew how to swim, and that includes most ship's captains and their crew. Here's a marker for Joseph Studley, who died at the age of 25 when he was struck by a bolt of lightning. And as it says so concisely across the top arch of his gravestone, the Lord spake and it was done, D-U-N. <laughs> Read the epitaphs. Often these added inscriptions are a source of information or occasionally amusement. The most common epitaph, stop and note as you pass by. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. Prepare for death and follow me. There were many variations on this theme. The answer? To follow you, I'm not content, until I know which way you went. <laughs> Lo, where this silent marble weeps, our neighbor, friend, and brother sleeps. Insanity and death are near allied. He gave the wound by which he died. The epitaph explains a suicide, information that's often omitted or coded in Latin in church and town records. The addition of the Latin phrase, philo de se, or felon of himself, is another way of denoting death by suicide. The origin of popular epitaphs may be found in old psalm books and hymnals, and of course, the Bible. Learn to look at the details of the gravestones, at the outline shape, the type of stone material, the carving designs, and the lettering styles. This information will help you determine when and where, and even by whom the stone was made. In the heavily settled coastal areas and radiating outward toward more rural New England, three major gravestone styles emerged in the 17th and the 18th century. First was a winged skull or a death's head. 
It reflected the harsh, basically medieval Puritan attitudes. Puritan burial was a civil, not a religious function in the earliest years of settlement. The second is a winged face, a soul effigy, sometimes described as a cherub, although I don't think it is, which seemed to stress the more optimistic attitudes of resurrection and immortality that were prevalent by the middle of the 18th century. And third, the urn and willow design, which reflected the impersonal, much more intellectual feelings of the New Republic at the turn of the century. In contrast to earlier designs, the urn and willow motif emphasized mourning, memory, not death itself. 1800 is considered by some to be the end of an era of symbolic gravestone carving in coastal New England. Much of the originality and the skill of individual carvers began to give way as more mass-produced grave monuments became readily available, more affordable, more popular. Actually, until late in the 1600s, the vast majority of early burials were probably left unmarked. Graves that were marked are thought to have had impermanent wooden post or rail markers, similar to this rare surviving example of an old grave board from Sussex, England. It has survived only because at some time in the past, a dispensary next to the old bearing yard needed a shelf. Someone borrowed this ancient grave board, turned it upside down, covered it with bottles, and when the hospital was torn down many years later, this grave board was discovered. If you look carefully, you can still see the painted skulls and bones that once decorated it. Another very early manner of marking graves was with a large flat horizontal stone. Slab stones, or ledger stones, or wolf stones, as they were sometimes called, were placed over a newly dug grave to prevent animals from disturbing the burial. The vast majority were left uncarved, and evidence suggests that they were sometimes moved from burial to burial as needed. This carved example rests over the grave of Anne, an early settler in East, Sud East Sudbury, who died in 1675. Two variations of this horizontal slab stone are box tombs and table stones. Here you can see an early box tomb, <clears throat> a horizontal ledger stone elevated for the ground and walled in on all sides. The body is buried or interred in the ground with the tomb built simply as a monument above it. A table stone is elevated from the ground on supporting legs or pillars. Many of these have given way, and you'll see these now sometimes flat on the ground, but originally they probably had supports. These box tombs and table, stone, table stones served symbolically as replacements for an earlier English custom of church burials, where the more affluent and privileged were entombed inside the church walls, under the aisles, or close to the altar itself. In fact, prestige was measured quite literally by one's proximity in life and in death to the church's altar. Following the Reformation, Puritans seeking to separate from the more Catholic tradition often chose internment outside the church. In many early Church of England congregations, the Anglican custom remained very strong, as it does still in the South, and so these places you can see memorial markers for some of the many church entombments of the 17th and 18th century. Toward the end of the 1700s and well into the 1800s, these family vault tombs came into use. Several factors helped to promote their popularity. There was a somewhat exaggerated fear of grave robbing, robbing and body snatching, along with a well-founded distaste for the overcrowded and neglected burying grounds of the times. Also, although most people wanted to be buried with other family members and loved ones, there was often no usable space nearby. These same factors eventually led, in 1831, to the founding of Mount Auburn Cemetery in Watertown in Cambridge, and the beginning of the rural or garden cemetery movement, which will cover later. Some of the first permanent markers were like this example, just field stone boulders. If carved at all, they usually had simply initials, a name, or sometimes just a date. 
They were obviously not the work of a skilled craftsman, but most, like this stone for Grace Fairbank, were probably handmade by a friend or a family member. While there are no reliable statistics for this early period, scholars believe that fewer than half of all burials were ever marked with a permanent marker. And from my own research, I'd say way fewer than half. Carved headstones and their corresponding footstones that were placed at the head and the foot of a grave begin to be more common in the 1670s and 1680s, still mostly a field stone, these earliest markers were very thick, sometimes eight to 10 inches thick and relatively small. The lettering was almost always done in capital letters supported by visible carving guidelines and individual words were separated by carved dots or little triangular marks called floating punctuation. This is one of the oldest surviving markers in the Boston area, and it was found buried near Boston's old state house in 1830 while workmen were digging Boston's first sewer system. The stone had probably been removed from nearby King's Chapel Bearing Ground to be used as a convenient drain cover. Sadly, gravestones were, and still are, frequently used as gutter covers, hearths, doorsteps, paving stones, sidewalks, covers for earthen cellar floors, patios or garden paths, even pastry slabs and coffee tables. For years it was thought that gravestones such as these were imported from England or Wales, but we now know that virtually all of New England's early stones were quarried and carved locally, usually within 20 or 30 miles of where they were used. Cape Cod and Long Island are exceptions to this generalization. Because there was no native stone suitable for carving, and thus no native carvers, until well into the 18th century, Cape Cod and Long Island imported gravestones from other locations. The earliest southern grave markers were, likewise, imported from elsewhere, usually in the south from Great Britain. Some outstanding exceptions are the mid to late 18th century New England stones that are found in Charleston, Midway, Savannah, and other southern locations with strong cultural or coastal trade route ties to the northeast. This is a richly carved stone showing the use of some common secondary death symbols frequently seen on early gravestones, coffins, bones, picks, and shovels. On many early stones, you'll notice the Latin phrase fugit hora, which roughly translates to mean time flies or hours pass, often illustrated by a winged hourglass. Early gravestone carvers were influenced by printed broadsides and popular emblem books coming over from England. Francis Quarles' emblem book engraving, for example, was undoubtedly the inspiration for a remarkable carving on the Joseph Tapping Stone in King's Chapel Bearing Ground. The stone depicts Father Time holding the hourglass, a scythe off to the right, remember death as the grim reaper, the skeletal figure of death holding the dart of death in his left hand, while the opposite hand is ready to extinguish the flame or the breath on the candle of life which sits above the worldly realm. Tempus irrit at the bottom of this scene means time is up or your time has run out. Gravestones were used to teach the living as much as to honor the dead. Most could not read the late Latin inscriptions on the stones and many could not decipher the English, but all, even the children, could see and understand the carved messages of a skull or a coffin or a winged hourglass where the sands of time had run out. This is a funeral broadside. It's a small notice or a poster that circulated to announce the death of the amiable virgin, Mrs. Rebecca Sewell, who died at the age of six years. Mrs. was used here as a title of respect. Titles such as Mr., Mrs., or Esquire were often used to denote family status, wealth, or education in the earliest years of the colony. A coat of arms was another means of indicating social position. 
The earliest heraldic grave markers were often quite plain, and it requires a bit of imagination to visualize the fierce winged beast at the top of this shield and the legendary griffin that fills the space below. This shield, or escutcheon as it's called, is an example of one of the unofficial or unregistered coats of arms that were commonly adapted and then adopted by local heraldic painters. Heraldic ar artists in Boston and other large cities freely created new coats of arms based on examples that were found in popular English memorial books. Although most who use these very early coats of arms had claim to wealth, education, or some degree of social position, very few New England families were actually entitled to call themselves armagers or arms bearers. Coats of arms found on gravestones with dates prior to about 1725 are somewhat more likely to be authentic. Small symbols such as a star, a ring, or a small bird are known as cadency marks. They're used to indicate the heraldic line of descent within a family. So here the detail shows a crescent, which is the cadency mark associated with a second son. It is not uncommon for armorial stones in, for New Englanders to turn up in faraway places such as Nova Scotia, St. Eustatia, or here Barbados. This very worn coat of arms carved in Boston for eight-year-old Elizabeth Yellings, who died in 1718, is being used as a sidewalk in Bridgetown, Barbados. The diamond-shaped heraldic device signifying a death is known as a hatchment. As a rule, with other forms of heraldic art, armorial tomb markers appear to be almost equally, equally distributed between Tory and Patriot families. The defining influence for the use of heraldic designs seems to have been more wealth and prominence rather than a specific political or religious affiliation. As you look at these old stones, you may find that you can pick out the work of one particular artist. After a while, the styles and techniques of individual carvers become recognizable, just like the familiar handwriting of an old friend. The following examples will introduce you to some of the country's earliest sculpture. This design was carved by Joseph Lampson, first of several generations of gravestone carvers who worked in Charlestown, Massachusetts. The, ti the tiny figures above the skull have been called death imps for no any anything in particular. And they were often depicted delivering the dart of death, carrying a pall, lowering a coffin, or engaging in some other funeral-related tasks. Most of the 40 or so death imp stones date from the first decade of the 1700s. The little death imp figures appear now to derive from needlework patterns and from needlework samplers that were popular in England in the 16th and 17th century. In the colonies, the surrounding material culture was especially rich visual research resource for carvers. Biblical themes such as Adam and Eve were popular in many forms of decorative and utilitarian art. The shared vocabulary of design elements could be adapted by local gravestone carvers as their imagination or their skill allowed. At the bottom of the tablet or the writing section on this early marker, notice the use of double dating for Mary Tuff's date of death. Before English calendar reform became official in 1752, the Julian, or the old style calendar, began the year on March 25th. The new Gregorian calendar began the year on January 1st. Therefore, when, for a time in the 17th and 18th century, when a death date fell between January 1st and March 25th, both years are frequently given. On this stone, we see 1702 old style, Julian, and 1703, the new Gregorian style. Now, isn't this a wonderful carving? It's only about maybe three and a half inches tall, in spite of the big picture. It's probably meant to represent Reverend Pierpont, as the figure wears a minister's collar and clerical tabs. 
His many buttons indicate that he was prosperous. Buttons were a bit of a status symbol, a statement of affluence and position almost always reserved for males. In the 16th and 17th century, it was commonly believed that your soul left your body through your mouth. Our custom of saying, God bless you, when somebody sneezes, results from the belief that your soul is being forced out of your mouth by a sneeze, thus leaving your body very unprotected and vulnerable to the terrifying powers of the devil. God bless you gave protection until the soul could return. Such a carving also depicts the soul being nourished by the vine, receiving sustenance. The vine has long been a symbol of the Christian church, or more specifically of Christ, who said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. Like the table stones of earlier years, true portrait stones were most popular with the affluent and well-educated, particularly ministers. This style became more common after about 1750. Notice the clothing details and all the buttons on display. Thaddeus McCarty's slate stone is patterned after fashionable needlework designs popular in the 17th century. It looks as lovely today as it did when it was carved more than 300 years ago. Ah, can you read some of the symbolism on this frequently reproduced stone for Susanna Jane? Notice the bats of the underworld, angels above. Death, the skeletal central figure, is triumphant, wearing a crown of laurel. Death is holding the sun and the earth, and the dart or spear of death is shown piercing the heart. A snake with its tail in its mouth, called an Ouroboros, encircles all, representing eternity, no beginning and no end. This was carved in Boston by Henry Christian Geyer in 1776. Now, after the first quarter of the 18th century, there were more and more carvers working outside the coastal cities. The rural area gravestones had a style of their own. They were more abstract, primitive, spontaneous. Inspiration often came from nature or from the stonecutter's own imagination, rather than from European styles or printed sources. A carver named Moses Worcester worked in and around Harvard, Massachusetts, the site of several early slate quarries. And here's the work of John Bull from Rhode Island. There is a very noticeable African influence in his work. Notice the neck coils. Perhaps a result of African blacks known to have been working in Bull's shop. Carver Daniel Hastings did this sole effigy of Lieutenant Bowen, and if you look closely, you can see the lieutenant's hand tucked inside of his military jacket in a style that was made popular by portrait artists of that day. Carver William Park and his two sons built castles in Scotland before immigrating to New England in the mid-1700s. They were master carvers whose work greatly influenced carving styles in the second half of the 18th century. This wonderful depiction of Reverend Nathaniel Rogers was done by one of the parks. See how his clerical robe is parted so that the viewer can appreciate his many buttons. The Park family of carvers were known for their very handsome portrait style stones, which suggest a question, how do we know who carved these old stones? Since unlike monuments of the 19th and 20th century, few early markers were ever signed or initialed. But once in a great while, some record is left in a diary, in an account book, or the probate files or court records. In this probate accounting, for example, the executor listed the amount paid to Stephen Robbins for the funeral costs for coffin trimmings and about halfway down, two pounds to the carver Thomas Park for gravestones. Finding the stone for which Thomas Park was paid two pounds and comparing it to other similar stones helps to identify the work of this particular carver. Now, as is true with needlework, silver, painting, furniture, different geographic areas produce their own recognizable gravestone designs. This is a typical Connecticut stone carved on the characteristic reddish-brown sandstone that's found up and down the Connecticut River Valley. Sandstone doesn't lend itself to very fine lines, so the Connecticut River Valley carvers tended to favor bold, 
less intricate designs. Their monuments are often quite large, and many include some remnant of a headdress or a crown, the Christian symbol of righteousness and salvation. Many Connecticut stones also have downturned mouths. Perhaps the only way a carver knew to denote sadness and mourning, otherwise there's just no explanation because there's so many of these. Notice that this Connecticut stone is carved entirely in Latin, which was commonly used for college graduates or ministers. You can identify Obadiah's alma mater. The popular carver named Gershom Bartlett migrated to Vermont and continued to carve this design. Another typical Connecticut design for a Connecticut man who died at the Battle of Stillwater in New York during the Revolution. Here the carver, a man by the name of Manning, used native Vermont marble. Notice where he made an error of the death, death date and how he just erased it. Marble began to be quarried in the Bennington, Arlington area of Vermont and in western Massachusetts toward the end of the 1700s. The southern Vermont carvers produced unique folk designs on their native stone. This one's been called Young Girl Stepping from the Bath. In the foreground is a stone for Peter Booz, a black man. It and another stone for an African American were at right angles to most other stones in this ancient burying ground. In the 18th century, of course, heaven was thought to have been the reward for only a select group of God-chosen white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. But there was a way around such ingrained beliefs. This is one of several uh, very remarkable stones for slaves that can be found in New England. Please just close your eyes for a moment and listen while I read the short epitaph to one such slave named Caesar. January 15th, he quitted the stage in the 77th year of his age, 1780. Here lies the best of slaves now turning into dust. Caesar, the Ethiopian, craves a place among the just. His faithful soul has fled to realms of heavenly light, and by the blood that Jesus shed is changed from black to white. <laughs> Gives me shivers. The Maxi family found a way to have their faithful African slave admitted to their whites-only heaven. Gravestones tell us something about mortality rates, especially epidemics. Notice that the stone starts out in memory of, instead of here lies the body that's seen on earlier stones. This reflects a change in attitude because by the end of the 18th century, the emphasis was on memory, on memorialization, on the mourners left behind, rather than on the harshness of death or on bodily remains. In memory of Mr. George Robbins of Wethersfield in Connecticut, who died August 18, 1798, at age 22. Far from the condolence of friends, he fell an early victim of the Boston epidemic. One friend mourned his exit, while the tears of strangers watered his grave. When George Robbins was felled by the Boston epidemic at the age of 22, he was only 13 years short of life expectancy at the time. This beautifully carved stone for Jabez Smith is a genealogist delight. It tells us when and where he was born, his military affiliation, the design and name of his ship, its home port, and finally, when and where Jabez Smith was anchored in the haven of rest. That was a popular hymn for many years. If you learn to look for stray marks on gravestones, you will frequently gain added information. The most commonly found marking is the price. Here the cost of the stone is shown in pounds, shillings, and pence, which was used until about 1790, which is when the new nation adopted dollars and cents as its official currency. The bottom of this stone advertises price, $7. The black staining that marred the beautiful design on this and eight other marble stones in the burying ground was caused by improper rubbing techniques. It has since been cleaned as best they could, but I leave it in as an example of the damage that can be done if you don't know what you're doing. 
Here's an example of a reused or a recycled grave marker. If you look carefully, you can still see the remnant eight on the left, directly below the N in November. Originally carved sometime in the 1720s, the stone was smoothed down and relettered 40 years later. Such recycling thrift is fairly common and fun to find, so be on the lookout for it. Now, toward the end of the 18th century, the deplorable conditions and resulting health hazards in city burying grounds forced Boston selectmen to order that new graves be dug a minimum of two feet deep so that bones and coffin debris would no longer lie on the ground surface to offend or infect passers-by. Epidemics of yellow fever and cholera, which raged in other port cities, helped fan the flames of panic in a public that began to associate decaying bodies and the conditions of the overfilled burying yards with the spread of such deadly epidemics. And so by 1825, an important movement was underway to do something about Boston's crowded and uncared for bar burying places. Under the leadership of a physician botanist named Jacob Bigelow, 72 acres of undeveloped land was purchased in Cambridge and Watertown, just outside of Boston, to be used as an experimental garden and a rural place of burial. This idyllic setting full of ponds, natural rolling hills and vales and open fields and woodlands, known to generations of Harvard students as Sweet Auburn, became Mount Auburn Cemetery, the prototype for the 19th century rural cemetery movement in America. Protectively enclosed and supervised, there was still great concern, both real and imagined, over grave robbing. The landscaped and beautifully natural new cemetery offered actual ownership of individual or family lots. This was a revolutionary concept at the time and not accepted by everyone. And it fostered the unique pre-need commitment to the family's own private burial spot. Even the name cemetery, which roughly translates to mean dormitory or sleeping place for the dead, was new. The negative image evoked by the words graveyard or burial ground was consciously avoided. Eventually, the word coffin was replaced by the term casket, a casket being a container for precious goods, something to be preserved, just as winding shrouds or rectangular fabric bags that had drawstring tops that were used earlier for burial were replaced by manufactured burial suits or special sleeping dresses. And the dark slate tombstones with death's heads and grinning skulls, which had been grimly reminding New England generations for generations that as I am now, so you will be, was, <clears throat> was rejected in favor of white marble and granite that referred to the deceased as simply asleep. The Victorians did not die. They passed on, they crossed over, they climbed the ladder or went home. Today, we might say they croaked, they kicked the bucket, they gave up the ghost, they finished the race, they bit the dust, they bought the farm, they flatlined, or they left the building. As you will see, reflected in the 19th century grave markers and funeral practices, a relatively new republic looked to a renewal of Greek and Roman ideals and to the grandeur of Egypt's ancient culture for inspiration. Napoleon's military campaigns, the rediscovery of Egyptian pyramids, and the excavation at the tombs of the pharaohs in this era led to renewed interest in all things Egyptian, especially in cemeteries. The rural cemetery movement was also an important impetus to ornamental ironwork and sculptural art. Individual family <coughs> plots were often enclosed in wonderfully ornate fencing, sometimes with the family name or coat of arms on the gate, and furnished with wrought iron benches and chairs or settees. Many rural cemeteries have family mausoleums and columbarium. The word columbarium comes from the Latin word meaning dovecoat or pigeon house, and the pigeonhole-like compartments of a columbarium hold cremated remains. These hollow metal markers, marketed mostly by regional salesmen, 
especially on Cape Cod, were popular from the late 1870s until shortly before World War I. Many large public monuments, like Civil War monuments, are cast in this white bronze, which is just the elegant trade name for zinc. The Monumental Bronze Company of Bridgeport, Connecticut was the original source and the primary producer of these cast zinc monuments. Catalogs offered customers a wide selection of styles and mix and match design motifs at a very attractive price, although some cemeteries deem them too industrial and too trendy and unproven to be allowed in their landscapes. For many of these cemeteries, their marbles are totally gone, and the only thing that remains readable are the zinc markers. Now, if you've ever visited a, uh, or strolled through a 19th century cemetery, you're probably familiar with the image of a kneeling child or this lamb marker, which is perhaps the most prevalent child stone. In sharp contrast to the Puritans who perceived children born into, as vessels of sin, uh, Victorians depicted children, especially in death, as perfect. They were unblemished, innocent. In 1870, 48% of those who died were under the age of five. Just take that in. Children's stones of this period often begin with an endearment before the name, memor memorializing our precious angel, our darling Annie, or here, our little Willie. Children were taught to view death as sleep, peaceful and beautiful. If you look careful at this realistic wicker cradle, you can almost see the imprint of little Mary's sleeping form on the stony pillow. The empty cradle was one of the popular themes known collectively as consolation literature, with titles such as The Key to Little Nellie's Coffin or I can see the angel, Mama. It's time to say goodbye. Consolation literature was intentionally emotional and full of tear-evoking pathos. Children's epitaphs sometimes came from this popular source. Most motifs and symbols found on 19th century grave markers were in everyday use in Victorian America. The design of a butterfly emerging from death's cocoon, for example, was common, familiar, the chrysalis is seen as symbolic of life's natural cycle, with the dead being transformed at resurrection. Also popular was this finger pointing, mostly, toward heaven, gone home. <laughs> and clasped hands, often accompanied by explanatory phrases such as, until we meet again. When the two hands are unmistakably male, the hand state handshake usually reflects membership in a fraternal brotherhood, such as the Odd Fellows or the Masonic Lodges. The twining vines shown here on a mausoleum door symbolize friendship, fidelity, and loving memory, as well as an abiding religious faith. And anchors, the Christian symbol of hope and eternal life, can be found in almost all Christian burying places. In seafaring community like communities like ours, an anchor may carry a dual meaning, Christian faith and maritime pursuits. And of course, angels of every description abound. Seen as messengers between God and man, angels are considered to be timelessly appropriate and comforting symbols of death and afterlife. These tree trunk markers, some as high as 10 or 12 feet, were especially common in the Midwest where many of them were made from Bedford, Indiana limestone. Smaller versions may be associated with the popular Woodman of the World Fraternal Organization, whose membership benefits at one time included these distinctive tree stump monuments. In this memorial frieze depicts the death of a woman in childbirth. Note the architectural egg and dart design that frames the scene. The egg, representing life, and dart, symbolic of the dart of death, are often found on classical monuments. In this romantically idealized classical setting, the mourning husband is clad in a toga. Such scenes of romantic agony focused on the deathbed or on the final farewell rather than on the grave. 
and a few of the popular weepers, another recurrent motif. Can't you almost feel the mourner's sorrow in these? Again, the emphasis is on the bereaved, those left behind, not the deceased. A fairly common example is a testimony to the Victorian belief that more is never enough. <laughs> Notice the popular needlework symbols such as a broken column, garlands, ferns, a banner to my husband. Such fashionable excess can be found in home decorating, in architecture, in clothing styles of the period. Just think about a Victorian parlor. Victorian bereavement was dictated by elaborate and rigid ritual with mourning rules minutely outlined in etiquette books and women's magazines because mourning restrictions and their societal enforcement fell mostly to women. Like the portrait style carvings of an earlier era, 19th century artists also attempted likenesses of the deceased. Unfortunately, very few of these early daguerreotypes and tintypes survive intact, although the recessed um, evidence of their former existence is not hard to find. Examples dating from the late 1800s up until today are numerous in many areas of the country, and this family photo is from Indiana, from Illinois, from California, and the use of photogra photographic images on gravestones is once again very prevalent in most regions of the country. And from its roots in Eastern Europe, this photo-based etching process is also gaining acceptance and popularity in America. Some, like this, are quite stunning. That is actually a grave marker. As you explore a cemetery, don't forget to look in church or synagogue plots, large institutional lots, special sections set aside for a particular nationality or ethnic group, and the areas dedicated to different fraternal organizations, policemen, firemen, and Civil War veterans. During the 19th and early 20th century, in the heyday of secret societies, there were close to 1,000 different fraternal groups in the United States. Roughly 50% of the adult population, both men and women, belonged to at least one of these fraternal benefit groups. Most of the fraternal organizations functioned in some way as benefit societies, forerunners of today's government-sponsored social security and welfare programs, health, life, disability insurance plans, the labor unions and farm cooperatives that we now take for granted. The odds are high that someone in your past belonged to at least one of these popular fraternal or benefit societies. Let's look briefly at a few of the most common fraternal emblems that are found on gravestones. The logical place to begin is with masonry. Free masons, or ancient free and accepted masons, as they are sometimes officially known, were believed to have been well organized in Boston and in Philadelphia by 1730s. This is one of the many Masonic emblems often found on gravestones but is perhaps the one that generates the most inquiries. So I'll let you in on this secret should you ever appear on Jeopardy. The letters on this common insignia stand for Hiram, the widow's son, sent to King Solomon, which is a lesson central to the Masonic degree of royal arch masons. Women associated with masonry may join the Order of the Eastern Star, and another large and well-known fraternal group distinct from masonry is the Independent Order of Odd Fellows, the IOOF, founded in Baltimore in 1819. The most common emblem associated with this organization is three links of a chain, often surrounding the letters FLT, which stand for the Odd Fellows motto of friendship, love, and truth. The women's group affiliated with the Odd Fellows is known as the Association of Rebecca Assemblies. Although there is no mistaking the fraternal symbolism highlighted on these four quilts, for example, their more subtle fraternal emblems often go unrecognized when they're incorporated into do domestic needlework or other art. The emblem of the improved order of red men usually depicts either an Indian profile or an eagle with the letters T-O-T-E, which stand for Totem of the Eagle. 
A popular auxiliary order for women is known as the degree of Pocahontas. Native Americans were not eligible to join until when in, well into the 20th century. Following the Civil War, hundreds of secret societies sprang up in the Deep South where four million ex-slaved look to family, church, and benefit societies for racial solidarity and economic survival. Most of these secret organizations offered social benefits along with life and burial insurance. African Americans who were excluded from almost all white societies developed separate lodges early on. In 1784, a black clergyman named Prince Hall opened the African Grand Lodge of Boston. Today, he's honored as the founder of black masonry in the United States. Like so many other fraternal organizations, the Knights of Pythias was founded in the aftermath of the Civil War when a divided, war-weary nation was seeking ways to promote brotherhood and a sense of national unity. The letters FCB, seen here, stand for the watchwords friendship, charity, and benevolence. Woodmen of the world advertise themselves as an organization for, quote, Jew and Gentile, Catholic and Protestant, agnostic and atheist. Woodmen sought membership only from physically fit and wholesome candidates, from the rural small towns and farms in the healthiest, read Midwestern, states. Excluded from early membership were saloon keepers, railway brakemen or engineers, firemen, miners, race drivers, employees in gunpowder factories, sailors, baseball or football players, submarine operators, aeronauts, and anyone living in a city. I'm not making this up. As immigrants from Europe poured into the country in the late 19th, uh, 19th century, membership in fraternal societies continued to grow. Sons of Israel, the German order of Haragari, Irish Hibernians, Sons of Italy, Polish Falcons, and hundreds of other ethnic lodges were established wherever the new immigrants settled. These fraternal enclaves often served as safe havens comfortable clubs where fellowship was strengthened by familiar language and accepted customs. One of fraternalism's most important attractions for immigrants was undoubtedly the emotional support and economic security it promised. The Junior Order of United American Mechanics was a popular nativist or anti-immigration organization founded in the wake of this country's massive influx of immigrants. Its emblem usually is composed of a square and a compass with an arm of labor wielding a hammer. And last, but not least, are the final resting places of beloved pets, companions such as Jane, the Chinese water dragon, who lived a wonderful and full life of 10 years, the greatest lizard I ever knew. <laughs> or Bunny, the beloved tough guy rabbit, just a quick peek at the thousands of poignant and revealing epitaphs on the grave markers of much-loved pets. So, the next time you find yourself near an old cemetery, or any cemetery, please take some time to wander and look, really look, at the gravestones. I hope you will see them with greater understanding and a new appreciation. In the short time allotted, I've tried to present an overview of some of the many pieces of information that can be found on gravestones. And just as we work to protect and conserve architecture, fabric, paper documents from our past, these chiseled records that remain also need our care. Without your help, much of the country's valuable legacy will vanish through erosion, vandalism, and neglect. Please. Help your local community protect and preserve these graven images and the many stories that they can tell. Thank you. Now you've sat long enough, so feel free to stand up and ask questions or whatever. Are you all asleep? Well, 
basically in this day and age, it's really not necessary because you all have superior cameras or phones or something and you can take a picture, um, produce it a hundred times. And so the rubbings are an issue now because um, they do damage the stone. And you say, oh, I'm just doing a little light rubbing. If you know exactly what you're doing, which you need special training and you need to know what kind of stone is appropriate to rub and what kind of materials. And uh, a lot of places have actually just outlawed the whole thing. Um, in this case, it was a classroom of students and a teacher who knew a little bit, but not quite enough. And there are several different methods and one method involves um, a tissue paper, which is nothing will go through that. It's it's a permanent barrier. Uh, and another method is to use rice paper, which is just the opposite. And you use a, a crayon, a special crayon. Um, this class of students used um, oil-based paint, which is appropriate for one kind of rubbing on the wrong kind of paper. So it just, it went all through. And so those stones had to be a little bit of the surface of that stone had to be removed to get back to what you could read as white. So it would be like taking a little of your skin off. And, and each time you clean a stone or do anything like that, it, just, it makes it more, um, more ready to accept the next layer of things that come along and stick to it. So that's what I would, if, I, don't, I don't say never do it because we have we have the only record we have of some stones from 40 years ago is because people who really knew were doing good rubbings. But if you're just going out to do that kind of rubbing, take a picture. Oh, you're all safe. Go ahead. Are you familiar with our old stones from the Caribbean? Very. And Love it. You have some, there are a lot of stones there from, um, ma mainly from three places, Boston, Plymouth, uh, I think there's a couple from Rhode Island. Um, most of these are all brought down from Boston. Um, the carvers that you saw, the Lampson, there's a lot of presence there of Lampson stones. Um, there were many generations of them. The father is Joseph Lampson, so the earliest ones are Joseph Lampson. And then his two sons, Caleb and Nathaniel, both carved. And then they, their kids and grandkids carved. So they go from the late 1600s through most of the 1800s as a shop, as a continuous shop. So you have a lot of their stones. They were popular carvers. They actually had a business as opposed to one man who carved in the winter and you know, and then there's a lot from Plymouth. And you can tell by looking at the quality of the type of stone. So the Plymouth stone is kind of a gray, green, um, not real smooth, great slate. The Boston stone is really a better slate. Um, but you, I can't, I can't remember the little charming little, there's little face stones that are in there that are just precious, very charming. and. There is a site called Find a Grave, which probably most of you have found already, but often they have photographs of stones and you can, you can look specifically at what's in your, you do have a wonderful cemetery, a wonderful site, and some really good early stones. And I'm sure there are tours, I know there are. And I'd help you, but I can't remember specifically what they are. Um, Quincy's called the Granite City, and they had a huge granite None of those were used for gravestones, they were basically used for buildings? Uh, granite. Granite came in much later because until you had power tools, until you had a way to carve granite, it was just too hard. Too difficult. I mean, these men were actually getting the stone out of, a, out of what you think of a quarry as a big hole in the ground because that's what it had become. But they were harvesting from outcroppings of stone, so they were not not quarried in the sense that you know. They were taking stone off ledges and so forth. They had to get that out with very few tools. 
Then they had to shape that stone, not with any wind or water power, by hand. Then they had to smooth that stone with sand and water. Then they had to carve it with a wooden mallet and a chisel, which continually needed to be continually sharpened. So it was, it was not a mass-produced business. Um, and then they had to find a market, and they had to get it there, and you know, and that's why you find the most, um, the most early graves that are marked are almost always on some convenient waterway because that's how they transported things. That's where their markets were. That's why you find things from Rhode Island and and Connecticut on the Cape because they had uh, trade routes and waterways. Don't miss the Red Sox. What? <laughs> it seems that there's a move uh, in recent years uh, towards cremation and away from just burial. Uh, from your experience, when people choose to be cremated, do they still end up having a stone? Or do they just well, not have a stone? The monument dealers are quite worried about this because more than 50% of the country now chooses cremation. And that has changed dramatically in 25 years. Um, many, many people have a place to put those cremated remains in a columbarium or in a monument, uh, a mausoleum or, um, you know, other, there are other places in most cemeteries where you can put cremated remains. And you can bury them and you can have a stone. And a lot of people are also selecting to just scatter them. And then many years later are wondering, maybe we should have just had a, some kind of a marker. When it, when it comes to yourself, you're saying, well, I know, I, it's like I never existed. So do I want a marker? Do I want a plot? And you, cemeteries are selling cremation plots, and they're small. But you could put cremated remains into a regular grave lot. So it's, it's evolving, and the newest ev evolution is green burials, which have no markers and no casket and no requirements for uh, embalming or anything else, ex except that the body is not embalmed. And those are unmarked, earth-to-earth -earth burials. And their cemeteries are, are actually being forced to, but they are accommodating this kind of burial because it's, as you run out of space, this, is a, this isn't a necessarily a lot or a plot that has a head, headstone on it. It's something else. You're awfully good to sit this long. Thanks. Yeah? With changes in society over the ages, uh, a while back they started using photographs, including last covered photographs. Do you see that going as far as having Oh, it's a potential and it's available. The QR codes, and a lot of cemeteries, there's a QR code next to your, your stone. And so the QR code links you to photographs, the person talking, the whole genealogy, anything they want to put on there. Um, and that was, that's, QR codes apparently are on their way out and something else is coming in. But there's a lot of uh, QR code usage. And, and yes, they can market these things, but you know, the next, the next innovation is 10 years away, and then it's who has the device to play it. But yes, you can get a, you can get a grave marker that has, plays music and gives, you, gives your whole history and anything you want on it, including your voice and your message to the world. I don't I'm, I'm still liking the old ones. <laughs> Anybody? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.